The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. They are neither the government nor the official opposition. But in a minority parliament, such as the one we have in Ottawa right now, the clout of the Green Party of Canada could matter. Tonight, as they seek to replace longtime leader Elizabeth May, we're hosting the only televised debates among the 10 contenders vying for the top job. We'll bring you five candidates tonight and five tomorrow night. Also tonight, how does our COVID-19 reopening compare to the rest of the world? We'll find out about a new data dashboard that tells that story. It's Tuesday, June 23rd, and that's ahead on The Agenda. The Green Party of Canada has been around for almost four decades, but it was only under outgoing leader Elizabeth May that it elected a member of parliament. They now have a caucus of three, and since Ms. May is stepping aside as leader, they're looking for someone that can keep and build on the gains under her leadership. They have no shortage of contenders. There are 10 candidates vying to take the reins. In the interest of actually hearing from each properly, we've split this into two debates. Five contenders tonight, five tomorrow. And with that, we welcome, in alphabetical order, in Clemensport, Nova Scotia, Judy Green, a Canadian Armed Forces veteran and the party's candidate in West Nova in last year's federal election. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Amita Kuttner, an astrophysicist and the party's critic for science and innovation for the past two years. In Saanich, British Columbia, David Murner, lawyer and the Green candidate last year in Esquimalt Saanich Sook. In Winnipeg, Manitoba, Glenn Murray, former mayor of Winnipeg and a former Ontario Minister of the Environment, among other portfolios. And here in Ontario's capital city, Annami Paul, lawyer, social entrepreneur and the Green candidate in Toronto Centre in last year's election. And we are delighted to welcome half of the people who are running for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada. And I want to start just by saying uh, we're obviously dispensing with sort of official debate rules here. There's no opening statement so that we're going to dive right into it and we'll do the best we can to make sure everybody gets equal time tonight. Let me put this premise out here and then we'll dive into this. When people think Liberal Party of Canada or New Democratic Party of Canada or Conservative Party of Canada, they have a sense where those parties are on the political spectrum and therefore some sense about what they're voting for when they vote. Where do you see the Green Party under your leadership fitting into that political spectrum? We know where it's been under Elizabeth May. I guess we want to find out how different mm -hmm. you would make the party if you were in charge. Judy Green, start us off, please. Awesome. Thank you for that question. We often get asked whether we're left or right or where we fall on the spectrum. And I think that we have evolved past a simple left or right. There's something called an axial shift, which actually takes into account um, issues of social responsibility and how well our people are doing. It, it fits well into the wellness economy. And I really like that um, approach much better than a simple left or right, because really the Green Party is about finding the best solution for the problems we have. And that solution may come from anywhere along that spectrum. It, we really have to be um, solution focused and long term uh, thinkers in terms of really fixing the problems, not just putting band-aids on them. I mean, so how you. would you answer that? Well, I definitely think that I am socially left and would like to see the party be squarely socially left. But in terms of economic policy, I believe what we're bringing forward is something entirely new, something that's being brought up across the world, especially now even in Europe, like circular economies and stuff like that. So it's going to be up to a, con up to a conversation with every community to see how that definition works on their political spectrum, which I think now has more dimensions than just two. David. I see us as Greens who are the most progressive party in Canada. We fought inequality. It's in our DNA. We were the first party to endorse equal marriage. You know, we're the first party to have a serious guaranteed livable income program to eliminate poverty in Canada. So we're very progressive. But 
We're also fiscally responsible. We, we cost every promise we make. We tell people how we're going to pay for it. So we combine the best of all worlds. I don't see us as just being left or right. I see us as looking at policy that's deeply transformative, solutions that work for Canadians. It's not about left or right for us. Enemy. Uh, thank you, Steve. And, you know, welcome everyone to my hometown, Ontario. First of all, I wanted to give those greetings. You know, I love getting asked this question, Steve, because the, the reasons are very clear to me. And I believe that particularly because of the pandemic, where Canadians are going to be asking themselves that question and looking at our party with fresh eyes. And what they're going to see is a party that is extremely, as David said, progressive. Uh, we are very progressive. We are interested in creating a more just and sustainable society. We are also extremely collaborative. And Canadians have seen how important that's been in terms of the, the, uh, the pandemic and getting things done quickly and getting relief to people. And so, you know, looking at a party that, that has that as, as its modus operandi, that really believes in that and wants to reinforce that throughout our political system, I think is absolutely something that sets us apart. And the thing that I'm most excited about and we talk about a lot in our campaign is daring. We are the party that pushes the discussion forward. We are the party that introduces those new ideas into the political discourse. And, you know, we need that more than ever now. We need that more than ever. And uh, if Canadians want to see more of that, uh, then they'll be looking at us. And I think that really sets us apart. Glenn Murray, where on the political spectrum do you see the Glenn, the, um, the Glenn Murray-led Green Party? Let's put it that way. Well, you know, I, I think we we span from green capitalists, uh, people who would be in the Tom Rand kind of philosophical world, the Toby Heaps, uh, to uh, eco-socialists and everything in between. But what differentiates us from that isn't a left-right split, because I think we're a big tent party in that sense, is that we're the only party that totally embraces a circular economy, uh, a, a, an economy which... Uh, reuses and repurposes materials that is completely committed to renewables. It's not just recycling for us or clean energy. It's a complete shift from an economy built on uh, resource extraction to one built on recovery and the inclusion and priority of wellness as the outcome. Uh, and that makes us dramatically different than the other parties. Let's dive deeper Steve, on that. Steve, um, if I could just jump in for a second. I'm sure. sorry, it's the obvious thing, and sometimes Greens forget it because it's so obvious to us. But what sets us apart from all of the other political parties more than anything else is our commitment to the climate and our commitment to targets that, are, that correspond with the science. We are the only party in Canada that has set targets that correspond to what we have been told uh, we need to reach if we're going to avoid the worst uh, impacts of, uh, of, of the climate uh, change that we're seeing. Well, let's dive deeper Sorry, on that so right now. Let, let, me, let me put a question to all of you right now. And um, Amita, why don't we get you to start on this one? The skies of our major cities right now are remarkably pollution-free these days. We know this. We can see it, we feel it, and there's evidence to back it up. That's perhaps one of the very few good things that this pandemic has delivered. But how do we take that positive development and run with it? When safety suggests, and here's what I'm getting at here, more people may drive their cars in future because they're afraid to get on transit. More people are going to be using single-use plastic because when they bring their reusable bags to go to the supermarket, they're not allowed to use them anymore. They get handed those plastic bags for fear of spreading the virus. Help us understand how we take this moment in time and run with it. Amita, you first. Thank you, Steve. It's so important that we actually embrace this moment because I think people have actually seen how precarious so many people's lives are and how much just a little shift can actually send everybody over the edge. And thus that need for absolute transformation of our economy, of our societies, to a place where we really care about each other is necessary. But what I find is interesting about those exact things, so the plastic bags and even the reduction in pollution, it's shown us on the pollution side how clean it can become quickly, but those things are also small. We haven't actually seen a significant reduction in our emissions across the planet, which is really what's going to be driving disaster. So we need to use this moment when everyone sees how our lives have become somewhat dystopian to bring forward that concept of a future where we can actually bring about the change necessary to confront climate change and also bring everybody into a more just, equitable way of living. David, how about you next? 
Yeah, I just like to pick up on Amit's answer. They're right when they say we are at the right time for deep transformational solutions to the problems we face, and we need to seize the moment. People are calling out for deep change, and what they get from the old line parties is incremental steps, small change. But we're we're a party that's really deeply based in evidence. You wouldn't believe the number of engineers and scientists, even on this panel that we have. And so let's take the evidence-based solutions. We're now listening to the public health doctors we never used to. Let's listen to the climate scientists. Let's listen to the experts who say we can make deep change in our society, in our economy, in how our government works, in how our social programs work. You know, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit is another example. It's not working very well for everybody. Bring in the guaranteed livable income because we know that can work. We've seen the pilot projects. So I agree. This is a time for deep change. And the Greens, the one thing that distinguishes us is we've always advocated change for the next generation and seven generations down the road based on evidence. And I think that's a really compelling offer to Canadians and also around the world. We can build something new uh, if we just listen to some of these leading edge Green Party policies. Glenn Murray, how do we take advantage of this moment? Well, I, I think we, we have to do new things, but we have to get back to what was working. Um, Ontario, where you're sitting, Steve, just was probably breaking about a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, not over the 2005, but over 1990 with cap and trade, with the closure of coal plants. We still have provinces that haven't closed coal plants. We hardly have a province or a working carbon pricing system. The federal carbon tax is a joke. Are, are, you know, when Ontario's EV programs and Quebec EV and cap and trade programs were either stalled or cancelled, we jumped 15 megatons in one year. We need to get people elected <laughs> who know how to design these programs quickly and get them back on track. We are going so quickly in the other direction. It's not funny. We, we have to be... Uh, we have eight years to stabilize our climate, uh, cap growth and GHG emissions and bring them down. Fortunately, that gives us, if we do the circular economy model, which circular economy is a commitment to zero emissions and zero waste, we can get there. But Canada has gone in the last three years from being a major leader in the world to being a global lagger. And only the Greens, you know, as my colleagues would all have all been saying, is the only party that gets this anymore and is committed to it. Judy, to you next. I agree with, with my fellow panelists, you know, incremental change is not going to solve the problems. We're seeing with COVID-19 that we're only getting small reductions and they're only temporary in CO2 emissions. We need to go after those big emitters. We have to, I mean, this is what got me into politics in, in the last election is that I recognized that we have to use political will to um, enforce regulations that are going to help us meet these targets. And the Greens are the only ones who have targets and a plan to get there, even more importantly. You know, we need to be looking at sequestering carbon. It's not a single, it's not a, a, a silver bullet, one thing that's going to fix the issues that face us. We have to be sequestering carbon. We have to be uh, using um, regenerative techniques in farming. We need to be really over like reshaping our our forestry it's not about you know the fiber that comes off the land it's about how much that value those uh, forestry areas are or forested areas are sequestering carbon that we simply cannot afford to release into the atmosphere right now so it is a, a broad spectrum and i think that's something people don't understand about the green party platform is that we have solutions for everything across the board and it's not just a single um, issue. So we can do it. We have a plan. We Anime, just need to get into Parliament. <laughs> Anami, let's get you on this one. You know, it's it's an excellent question, and you know, we we might not have an opportunity like that this for a long time. I just heard last night from some Greens that I was speaking to. You know, they said in, that are in their 60s and 70s that they have never seen a moment like this. And so you're absolutely right. The question is, how do we harness it? And this is where this is where government comes in. This is where political parties come in. You know, we have been we've been slowly over time drip 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 taught to think small, think small, think small, 
think, you know, in, in, in micro targeting. And really what we need to be doing now is building a grand vision for the country. We have seen through the pandemic that it is possible for different levels of government to cooperate. We've seen how much good comes out of collaboration. And really that is the direction that we need to be headed in. And I agree with uh, the other panelists that, um, you know, the Green Party is the, and choosing the Green Party is the single best thing that people in Canada can do if they want to see that grand vision um, implemented. And so, you know, I, I look to the European Union. I spent many years working in the European Union for our government and other multilaterals, and I see their EU Green Deal. I see their carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism. Um, Glenn, I think we moved on a bit perhaps from cap and trade, uh, and I see the future. And so if they can do it, Canadians can do it. People in Canada are up to the job. They just need it articulated uh, by their leaders, and this is where leadership matters the most. Well, since you mentioned Glenn Murray, I should give him a chance to come back on that because he was the environment minister in Ontario that brought in the cap-and-trade plan that the Ford government subsequently cancelled. Uh, Glenn Murray, do you think the time for cap-and-trade has come and gone? No, I, I think it's, it's necessary but not sufficient. Cap-and-trade is the only system that works. The European systems aren't working. Um, California and Quebec are still on track. Quebec, Ontario, and California, because what cap and trade gives you, it's a legislated cap. Ontario was coming down at 4.3% per year. So what you get with cap and trade is you get a guaranteed reduction because you're, you basically have built a carbon budget, which is what we need to do, and you reduce that by 4.3% per year, making it impossible for anyone to emit greater than that. What, what a carbon tax like the Canadian ones have just gives you price certainty. It sets the tax. And no legislature has been prepared to raise it to the 40, 50, 60, 70 or dollars a ton necessary to have an impact because the only impact it has. Uh, so but like Glenn, I mean, Glenn, uh, would we say that that's a question? Wouldn't we say, Glenn, that that's a question of leadership as opposed to a question of what works best? I mean, we have a general consensus amongst economists against Nobel Prize winning economists that a carbon tax is the cheapest, most efficient way um, when compared to cap and trade and other means uh, to actually get to our target. So are we really getting back to the main thing, which is the leadership that's needed in order to uh, convince Canadians that this really is the best and cheapest option for them? Show me a tax system in the world that's working and show me any system that was more effective than the Quebec, Ontario, California cap and trade system. Nobody was reduced. Let me finish. I, let, let, you, let me just finish. And that's not enough because you need a legislative cap. You also need mandates right now. To get to switch our fleet off electric vehicles, we are going to have to mandate, as we did going into the Second World War, so, and, and as we did with coal plant closures, we're going to have to limit the number of, of um, internal combustion engine vehicles that can be sold every year. We've got to get to Z mandates. We have to do a lot more. We have to legislate the shift in technologies. We only have 10 years. But there isn't a tax system in the world that came close to the success of the California, Quebec, Ontario system. There was just simply is the one that achieved those results. Let me hear from the other three of you on this. David, uh, we, we have the federal carbon tax that's in place right now. We hear conservatives talking about getting there via regulation. We've heard about cap and trade. There are other ideas out there as well. What do you like? Well, it's ironic that the conservatives are talking about regulation because that seems to go against the whole idea. The great thing about cap and trade and the carbon tax is that you're setting a pricing mechanism and that's what we need to do. Uh, I think that Glenn is right. We need a comprehensive solution. I, I, I actually agree with Hanami as well that putting a price on carbon is essential to getting there. But it's way beyond that. We need to transform the way our economy works. We need to create the largest job creation uh, program in Canadian history through the Green New Deal. We need to build an east-west electrical grid across our country, powered by renewables. And we need to make a just transition where no one's left behind from fossil fuels to renewables. So we need to talk about a big comprehensive uh, solution to this problem. It's not about whether one little change or another is better. It's about how do we make big transformational change in something where the scientists are telling us we only have five or six or seven years to go before the global climate emergency becomes irreversible. So it's time for action on all fronts. It's time for all hands on deck right now. Amita, can I get you to weigh in on this? Yeah, so I think everybody has brought up really important points, but we're actually missing the core of it, which is we don't have seven or eight years. We have zero. No.
And I speak from a scientific perspective here, and I love the conversation about evidence-based policy, but generally, we really don't actually see anything that's evidence-based. And if we look at what's going on across the entire planet right now, there's already destruction. And I've been through it myself. I lost my mother and my house in a mudslide. And so I'm watching everyone across this planet suffer already. It's not seven years. It's every single minute we can possibly get to do everything we can. So I agree, it's going to take more than one method. But we have to work together and we have to be aware that we are actually in a position of privilege based on where we are in the world in terms of direct climate impacts. That it's far worse and we have a responsibility with our prosperity to do as much as we can, as fast as we can. Judy. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, carbon tax is uh, just one tool in the toolkit, and we don't have time to have this incremental change, and we have to have the political will. We have cap and trade in Nova Scotia, and they, they really fumbled the ball because what they did is the top three emitters, they gave them their carbon, carbon credits for free for four years. So that's delaying us from actually reaching those targets in four years. So the political will has to be there. The understanding has to be there. I hear conversations from, from our political leaders who don't truly understand how carbon pricing even works. And that, that is, these people are making the decisions. And that's terrifying when we don't have time to play these games. We have to, to have a fully fleshed out plan and we have to get started on it now, preferably a year ago or four years ago or 10 years ago, but we have to do what we can now. And that means everything. That means all hands on deck and there's no pussyfooting around any longer. Can I ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring that five shot back up so I can see everybody at once and perhaps through a show of hands. Is there anybody here who thinks we need more pipelines in the country? <laughs> any show of hands? Okay, that's an O for five, right? We have no pipeline supporters on this group right at all. Okay, understood. In which case, I'm not even going to waste time on that question because uh, if there's nothing, if there's nothing to debate, there's nothing to debate. Let's move on. The liberals and New Democrats, they would say, had serious environmental planks in their last election <laughs> platforms. Have they become green enough? The Conservatives are a different story. Uh, for whatever reason, polls have suggested that, that the public didn't see them as having a serious uh, environmental policy on climate change. Do you think those parties have become green enough to make you redundant? Uh, go ahead, Glenn Murray, start us off. No, they're, they're, you look at them all from BC, the Green, the, the NDP particularly, uh, have, are now one of the parties that's contributing to major greenhouse gas emissions in supporting fossil fuels. I mean, you've got, I mean, the project that they're supporting in BC uh, is going to do more, create more pollution than the $2.8 billion the Ontario Conservatives are putting into gas plants. And, and I, I think what's, we know what works now. I mean, what New Zealand is doing works. To an extent, Norway has a huge 20-plus sales tax on internal combustion engines, so they can do that. But if you're not prepared to have a high carbon tax, a very high one, or a cap-and-trade system which, which can deliver the same results at $15, $20, $25 dollars a ton that takes 60 or 80 or $100 dollars a ton to do that, we need systems that work. The only party that seriously is talking about workable systems that you could get elected on, because no one's going to get elected on a $300 carbon tax, that you need caps, you need a trade system, you need things that keep it affordable and work well in the economy. We know that now. We know California is working. We know the carbon tax jurisdictions are still seeing emissions go up. So the, and the NDP used to support cap and trade under Jack Layton. It was very popular when they did that. And part of the reason Jack supported it was because it's not just environmentally effective, you can get elected on a cap-and-trade system and you get better results with a cap-and-trade system. So I, I think we actually have to have, for an evidence-based party, we should look around the world and we should actually look at the evidence. And that the other one that works is fee and dividend, and it works very well as a complementary system, as a social equity model, as it does in California. And we need to be, we need to be, hold ourselves to our own standard of evidence-based standard. We need something that could work. And Amita, we have to get way down. We, we should be 10, 20, 15 percent down within 10 years because the number I'm talking about in 10 years is we have to be carbon neutral long before 2050. And if we don't cap our emissions in the next couple of years, bring them down. I totally agree with your assessment. Australia lost a quarter of its forests. Syria has eight points. 
Oh, I think we have our, our first technical difficulty, which is amazing. We've lasted this long without one. We'll get back to Glenn Murray in a second. Obviously, in this era of COVID, we're using different kinds of technology here and stuff freezes up from time to time. Judy Green, do we still need the Greens? Because uh, the Liberals and New Democrats would say, we've got the in government, we've got the environment pretty well covered in our platforms. Well, they certainly talk the good talk, but, you know, actions speak a heck of a lot louder than words. And when push comes to shove, they cave in every single time. We've seen that over and over and over again, and we have to stop it. You know, uh, what they say, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You know, the Greens are the only ones who've been consistent with, with their their message consistent with the solutions has been evidence-based, and we're ready to go. I feel like saying, you know, we're ready. Send us in, coach. <laughs> And to me, Paul, how about you? Uh, the Greens were done then at this point? You know, it is such an interesting question, and I actually did uh, a mental exercise about that when I was thinking about the Green Party when I was deciding whether to run or not. I said, if the Liberals and the NDP just swallow our climate policies whole, they just, they, they're converted, they've decided, they're, they're, they're on board, is there a reason for the Green Party to exist? And I believe absolutely there's a reason for the Green Party to exist, and I touched upon it before. It's really all about the fact that we are the ones that propose those policies that they, um, that they um, absorbed. And that happens time and time and time again. Whether you're talking about the, the NDP's um, newfound, and we're very happy, I'm personally very happy, their newfound interest in guaranteed livable income, or um, you know the growing consensus around universal pharmacare, or plans for uh, tuition-free post-secondary education. It is the Greens that have put those ideas into the political discourse, and we do it based on evidence. We do it without fear, and we do it on behalf of people in Canada. We are the party that uh, that occupies that space. Um, it's unfortunate we're the only ones. I welcome and invite the other parties to join us there. But until there is another party that prioritizes the people first and the evidence-based policy first, there will always be a role for the Green Party in Canada. Amita, your view on that? I think this one is a bit tricky. And I'll start off by saying, absolutely, there's a massive, important place for the Green Party. But I think to actually maintain our relevancy, we have to shift and shift back to our core and our values and everything else that we bring. And I say this because we saw in the last election, that was kind of the last time we were voting in Canada in a sort of preemptive way on climate. Now we see dis disasters here, like tornadoes and flooding. And we're at a point where just having climate policy isn't good enough. And we see that through the other parties. It's completely believable. And it makes sense that it's hard for us, for any person, to differentiate climate policies and what's good enough when everyone is promising the same thing. So we actually now have the job of building a movement, returning to our core of ecological wisdom, of presenting this picture of the world where we can live for generations sustainably, looking after each other with, with high well-being, mm -hmm. and come back to our core also of representation, of bringing people to government. And I think by showing ourselves to be unique from the other parties, as well as always being the leader on climate and the ones that can also be the best on response, we will have more than a place, but a place for government. David. The other parties promise real change, but they consistently deliver either small change or they do the opposite of what they said during their campaigns. We see that here in British Columbia with the NDP, they're pouring $6.6 .6 billion into the fossil fuel industries here into a market that actually isn't sustainable. They're logging more old growth forest here on Vancouver Island than under the Liberals. And it's the same thing with the federal Liberals. The Liberals have said, you, we will cut fossil fuel subsidies to zero. And now we are subsidizing fossil fuel companies more than any other country in the OECD uh, per capita. So it's shocking. And one of the things the Greens can say is, we do not do this. Environmental issues, ecological wisdom, these are core to our values. We are not going to break our promises. We're not going to say one thing and do the other. But more than that, we also, social justice is one of our core value. And we also have really well thought out plans, fully costed on how we leave no one behind when we make the transition off fossil fuels and onto renewables. We have those, those plans costed out 
by the parliamentary budget officer. They're very credible, serious plans. And I think Canadians are at the point, especially now in these times of COVID-19, to look at us in a new way, say, we need change. We need deep transformational solutions. And we just can't count on the old line parties to keep their word. So let's try the Greens. Give the Greens a chance. Okay, we're down to less than 10 minutes to go here. Time flies when you're having a good time. And I wanna see if we can get two more questions in before we're done. Perhaps one of the biggest public policy issues that all of you, whoever wins this thing, will have to deal with in the future um, is to weigh in on this issue of whether to defund the police. And I know that means different things to different people. For some people, it means getting rid of the police services entirely. For others, it means taking that money that perhaps goes to police budgets now to have them respond to mental health issues and redirect it to others who uh, can perhaps more effectively answer those calls. Uh, Amita, why don't you start us off? Defund the police. Are you for it? Are you against it? What does it mean to you? I am absolutely for it, but its definition is definitely incredibly important. So I think it's also a long-term, not too long, but it's not an immediate thing. It's not an immediate process. So the first thing is to start deflecting funds towards health, towards education, towards community systems, because right now we see definitely overfunding of police. But there's something that that diversion of funds will never accomplish, and that is undoing of systemic racism, violence, and oppression. So I do think that we need to completely overhaul the system completely break it down and apart and rebuild different systems. So whether it be mental health professionals re responding to mental health calls or community safety organizations to make sure that everyone on the ground is safe. But it does not also deny the real fact that we have some violent crime. But a lot of that is not by us, not by regular people. And so you may have to have a response force for that, but it cannot be one that is based in systemic racism, and it has to be apart from kind of regular life. Enemy Paul, what does defund the police mean to you, and do we need to do it? Thank, thank you very much, Stephen. You know, this is something that touches Black Canadians uh, and Indigenous peoples overwhelmingly disproportionately. We are the two most overrepresented groups in the criminal justice system. Uh, we are the two groups that suffer most from excessive police use of force. And so it's something, of course, that is, it's just a day-to-day -day reality uh, for me and for, for my community and for Indigenous peoples across the country. Um, I, I know that there are, are candidates, um, um, Amita among them and some others who have called for abolishing the police. Um, I do not think that that is, um, that that is um, the, the right strategy. Uh, I, I know from personal experience, and, and many others will tell you that uh, it may be a very small number or per percentage of the population, uh, but there are some very bad people doing some very predatory things, and there's no amount of community or social services that is going to stop them from doing that, and we want them off of the streets. And so what we need to do is just be very clear about what is the appropriate role for the police and what is the appropriate role for other types of social services. And if I can just give a couple of things that we can absolutely start with just today, there, there is no need to delay. We can adopt the recommendations of the United Nations Working Group on People of African Descent. Uh, the, um, their recommendations apply to Black Canadians. They also would apply to Indigenous peoples as well. Uh, and it is very mm -hmm. comprehensive and it's the result of a lot of work in the community. And we can, and we have launched a petition in my campaign for a national database on police use of force so that we can get the data, the disaggregated data that we need to know how deep the problem is. We know that it is catastrophic, um, but the numbers need to come to light so that we can actually take the action that we need to. Okay, and David, finally, forgive me for jumping Steve, in. I'll Sorry, enemy. For, for, I'll for, indulge myself for one more second just because of this issue. I will say that one of the most impactful things that people in Canada can do if they really care about this issue is to put Indigenous peoples and Black Canadians in positions of power so that we can talk for ourselves, so that we can implement the changes that are needed. The, the time for the listening is over. We have been very clear. It's time to allow us to take the action. Okay, let's go to David Murder next on this issue of defunding the police. Thanks, Steve. The Parliamentary Black Caucus has come up with a really good plan around police reform and how we fix uh, a broken justice system. This is not just about the police, it's about a justice system. And more fundamentally, it's about systematic 
systematic racism in our society. But we can overcome this. We have plans like the, the plan put forward by the Black Parliamentary Caucus. And I think that what we need is systematic change. I've worked inside the justice system for 28 years. I worked in human rights, I worked on indigenous justice, and I've seen this myself. We need a justice system that is open to deep change, which is about empowering multidisciplinary teams. So the police, when they go to a place where there's a mental health issue, are not the first ones there, unless there's violence and danger that's real danger to the mental health workers. We have a perfect example here in Victoria, British Columbia, assertive community treatment teams that work together and that make sure that the right person is doing the right job. Right now, we have too many silos in our justice system. We have too many silos in the way our government works. We need to focus on service to Canadians. And if we do this right, we can lead deep transformational change. That's what the Greens have always stood for, and it definitely applies here in addressing racism in Canada. Judy Green, to you, please. Uh, can I just push? No, no, no. Enemy, forgive me, forgive me. I, we're we're going to no. run out of time, and I got to make sure okay. everybody gets somewhat equal okay. time here. Okay. Judy Fair Green, up to, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that we're actually dealing with multiple um, uh, issues right here. You know, we're, we're dealing with um, so hor horrendous um, violence against, um, you know, people who are black, indigenous and, and people of color, and which are, are not excusable in any way, shape or form. We're dealing with um, a corporate culture within um, a very col colonial system. And that has to change. And I'm not convinced that we're going to root that out by having slow incremental changes. You know, we have to change the mindset from being reactionary, only dealing with things after the fact, having our police officers going out and expecting to be dealing with criminals, even when they're dealing with somebody who might be having a mental health crisis. They only have one tool in their toolbox, and that's not um, efficient. And it's not fair to put them in that position either, because we need to be doing these multidisciplinary teams. We need to be having social workers going to these wellness wellness um, calls. We need to be looking more at prevention within our communities as well. Guaranteed livable income, bringing people out of poverty, um, which reduces alcoholism and, and addictions. It, it, um, it uh, keeps people in school. It uh, reduces crime. And we have the stats that back that up. So the way I see it is it needs Needs to be a shift, and it will be defunding because those those um, as we put money into these social supports, these preventative measures, then the police will be called on less and less in those communities, and so therefore the funding for them will be less necessary. And we absolutely have to stop militarizing our police. And I am a veteran; I understand that there's a place, you know, to be able to defend ourselves. It is not in our police force. Uh, we do need we do need um, a rapid action to the uh, units to be able to address the violent crime that is still happening and will continue to happen, um, even with these these um, in place. But what it's going to do is it's going to make it more equitable so that we have far fewer people in, in prison and in the legal system simply because they come from um, a community or, or of lower means and don't have um, the supports and the privilege. Okay, that Judy, do. forgive me, I'm jumping in because we've literally got a minute left and I've got to give it to Glenn Murray to weigh in on this. The last minute to you, Glenn. So when I, when I was mayor, the policing budget was 20% in Winnipeg. It is now over 30%. Um, all other services, housing, parks, recreation, social support, social services, were 50% of the budget. They're now 35%. The New Deal for City, which I, I worked on, pushed massive amounts of money from the federal government to cities. But you've got to relocalize this. The best housing programs in Winnipeg were when the community ran them. We need community-based development corporations, social enterprise. We were we were we built 6,000 affordable housing units, massively reduced crime, with a community-based policing model that was that used more health inspectors, social services folks, and building inspectors to enforce the law and bring civility. Decentralized government, put more money back in cities. I don't think you need a constitutional change because you'll never get it, but there's nothing stopping it. We were so close. We, we, we put five cent a liter gas tax. The federal government has to transfer tax revenue to cities and city governments have to give power back to those racialized minorities. School boards, community groups, let the communities run themselves. Toronto used to, under David Crombie, have neighborhood planning sessions and every neighborhood developed its plan and neighborhood corporations and social enterprise, not government run programs. Re-empower people, relocalize it, follow the philosophies of that great adopted Canadian Jane Jacobs. 
We know how to do this. We just have to fix it. So defund the police is more about let's restore funding to, to neighborhoods. Let's restore power to racialized communities. I did that very successfully when I was mayor, and it, it, we literally transformed neighborhoods. But we really didn't do it. When I said we, the people in the neighborhood do it. And those programs are destroyed. We're now into surveillance, policing, police helicopters, smart technology, cameras, face recognition. This stuff is costing us a small fortune, and it, it, it enhances racism and, and enhances colonialism. Friends, that's our time. Mr. Director, a five shot is exactly what I wanted, please, so we can thank Judy Green, Amita Kuttner, David Murner, Glenn Murray, and Enemy Paul for joining us on TVO tonight. Good luck to all of you, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. COVID-19 cases are down and Ontario is opening up. Even the provincial capital will move into stage two this week, leaving only Windsor-Essex in stage one. How does our reopening here and across Canada compare with other countries? Political science professor Peter Lowen from the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy is part of a team that's created a way to find out. It's called reopeningaftercovid.com. And Peter Lowen joins us now via Skype from downtown in the provincial capital to explain. Hi, Peter. Good to see you again. How are you managing? Uh, very well, thanks. And thanks for having me on. Not at all. Good to see you again. From a policy standpoint, how sound do you think Ontario's lockdown and subsequent reopening strategy has gone? Well, I think, look, I mean, I think there's two things to say about it. One is that it's really hard to know what uh, works actually uh, when we're when we're talking about these policies because there's there's a couple of things that are complicated about it right one is that there's a lag between when you open things up and when people start getting close to one another and when there are spikes in in COVID so it's actually hard to to measure it that's that's one thing that makes it difficult the second thing that makes it difficult is that you know what we're doing here is we've got government setting a number of rules about what can be open and what can be closed and where people can go and where people can't go and those rules are sometimes loosely adhered to. So the behavioral responses of, of people to these rules are hard for policymakers to know with certainty, right? So kind of putting all these pieces together to figure out what's working is is difficult. But here's here are the kind of the success measures, I think, um, in Ontario so far. The, the government's been able to come up with a um, with a strategy that is that is regionally focused. That's important. You know, my 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 parents live in North Bay, essentially zero cases of COVID um, in that in that health region. It's not clear to me that they should be under the same degree of lockdown that Toronto should be under. So the province has found a way to to basically um, let different regions open at different speeds. That's important because the longer we keep a lockdown on, the harder it is for people to adhere to it, especially if they're not seeing um, the benefits of it. So it's successful um, in that way. And I'd say the second thing is that, you know, social distancing is starting to taper off, but people are still doing the common sense things that they need to do to try to stop the, the, the spread of, of the disease. It'd be better if there was more mask wearing, it'd be better if people stayed home a little bit more, but we haven't seen a complete abandoning of, of social distancing. Right, well, uh, you're a political scientist, but you and I both know there's always been more art than science in politics. And I wonder whether, for example, um, should we have had more testing before reopening much of the province? Should we have better contract contact tracing resources in place before reopening? Should there have been stricter quarantine before reopening? How would you answer all of that? Yeah, so there's three there's three things there, right? Mm -hmm. One is, uh, uh, well, the, the last one was contact tracing, uh, or sorry, quarantining, contact tracing, and then and then and then and then testing. Yeah. Look, I think we were frankly a bit slow off the mark on testing. It took us a while to get it up to the level that it that it should be at. We've got daily rates of testing that are that are higher now, but I think I think look, I think there are big questions to be asked at the level of of regulation and at the level of approving testing for why. We don't have more technologies that are allowing people to understand the current state of their of their health vis-a-vis um, vis-a-vis -vis COVID and more generally, but vis-a-vis vis-a-vis COVID. On contact tracing, um, I, I was lucky enough to work with some senators that are working on this question a month ago. Now uh, we did a very rigorous study of Canadians. The basic story was that once you explain to Canadians this, the 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 idea of proximity tracing, you explain to them the benefits of it. Um, and kind of what the trade-offs are between why we need it and, and what you have to give up to have contact tracing, there's support for it. And I, I think this has been the one area where political leadership has been has been most most lacking. You know, if I were the government, I would just offer to pay everyone's cell phone bills for the next six months if they downloaded a proximity app that had decentralized uh, tracing and we could know 
uh, much more accurately whether people have been exposed to COVID than we know now, and certainly much, much uh, more rapidly by an order of magnitude. Finally, on quarantining, I mean, I think we have to do a proper retrospective of what's gone on. And we have to be fair that politicians have been in a very difficult position in trying to fight this thing. This, this is an incredibly difficult problem to deal with as, as, as politicians. But um, if the numbers are true, you know, something like a million Canadians in the first six weeks of this should have been under quarantine at some point. And the number, for example, of RCMP checks on, on houses to see whether people were abiding by quarantines was less than 5,000. You know, we, we, uh, we had people coming over the border three, four weeks into this pandemic, and we weren't rigorously ensuring that they were going to be quarantining at home and finding a way to really follow up on that. We fell down there. And the result of that is that more people died than needed to die. Hmm. We have divided this province up into not quite three dozen public health regions, and all of them are open now into stage two, at least, except for Windsor, Essex. And I wonder if you could compare where we are in our reopening of society to, say, other jurisdictions around the world that you've looked at. Sure, sure. So, so we're in a position where, um, you know, we kind of look like the average around the world. So if, you know, if I wanted to compare us, for example, to, to, to Michigan, right, which is a state that looks a lot like, well, like ours, people can do this on our dashboard. They're welcome to do it. What we do is we divide up economies into nine different sectors um, where there are different sets of uh, reopening rules. And then we look at every OECD country, five provinces, five states. It'll be every province by the end of this week. But you can see where, where, your, where, your, where your province is compared to other, other jurisdictions. So if we compare us to Michigan, for example, we're, we're more restrictive about gatherings. Um, we're more restrictive about uh, about border movements, uh, and that we're a little stricter about quarantines and people coming in once they've come into the to the province from outside the country. Uh, we're both comparatively high on manufacturing and construction. You can think about why that is for a second. That Michigan and Ontario would be, in, in global terms, pretty high in terms of our openness on what we're allowing in terms of manufacturing right now. And then we're the same across everything, except that we're more strict right now on schooling. Um, it means that overall we're lower than we're lower than Michigan. Ontario sits about about in the middle. We're in the same dynamic as most other places, and that we're opening up now at kind of a similar pace that other places are are opening up. But we were closed down for uh, for you know longer than some American states, and and certainly when you look at the American states, which are having explosions now in COVID again, we were much more locked down than them. And you can you can figure out whether this was good policy or not if you look at those those places. Mm -hmm. How about compared to other provinces? How are we doing there? We're doing okay. It's basically, you know, it, it's it's a bit of a mix. So if I look at British Columbia, which has been a which has been a very a, a pretty successful case, New Brunswick has been a more a more successful one. We're actually the same on average, kind of overall where we are. Uh, we're more open on on construction. They're more open on restaurants. So so there's a mixed bag in terms of where where uh, we're more open and less open. But overall, we look to be um, about the same as as British Columbia. This is an interesting thing about Canada, right? That there hasn't been really substantial variation in, uh, I mean, there's nuanced variation, but there hasn't been really substantial variation across most measures across most provinces. The areas where it's notable have been restrictions on movement, right? So New Brunswick is a very hard province to get into right now. Prince Edward Island is a very hard province to get into. Ontario has not had those restrictions. Um, for example, they'd be hard to enforce within within the province because it's huge, but we've not even had them at our, at our, at our borders. Um, how strictly quarantines have been observed uh, and have been enforced is uh, another matter. My impression is the quarantines were more strictly observed and more more strictly socially sanctioned, frankly, in New Brunswick, for example, than they were um, in Ontario. But for the most part, there's been a lot of variation in Canada in terms of deaths with COVID. So many in Quebec, almost none in, in New Brunswick, none in PEI, less in Ontario. BC is doing better. Um, so there's been all that variation, but there hasn't been actually that much policy variation which is, which is an interesting question for us going into a second wave. I want to ask, um, I guess this next question requires more of a political judgment as opposed to just following the hard data. And that is, you know, the great fear for politicians is as we reopen right now, that cases will spike up and that they will then have to retrench and close us down a bit more. And that really does get into some difficult, tricky political territory. Mm -hmm. How do you see the potential of all that unfolding? I think it's very, I think it's very, very difficult. I mean, I, I, I don't know that we've learned any lessons right now that have got us prepared for the fall, when we're going to be opening again. I think that's a, that's a major, that's a major constraint, Steve. Um, I'll tell you what my, what my intuitions are. We'll have data to back this up sooner than later, but my intuitions are that 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 politicians 
are very, um, you know, rightfully you you would be in their position. They're very concerned about 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 deaths. They're very concerned about trying to reduce the amount of mortality um, around COVID, and they're more likely to wait up deaths when they're thinking about um, the trade-offs they're making than they are impinging on or impeding on the freedom of of citizens to move around, to see family, et cetera, et cetera. Citizens, I think, are less concerned about that, and you can you can understand why. You know they don't they don't have to face face the voters and they can be more they can be more myopic um, about these things. But I think that I think that the difficult position that we're in right now, uh, kind of from a from the from the politics of it, but also from the policy of it, is that we've wrestled COVID to the ground in Ontario, we're wrestling it to the ground in, in in Quebec. It's been wrestled down in BC, but in Ontario we haven't completely stamped it out. We're not we're not in the position of New Zealand now where there's no new cases. We're ticking along at 150 200 a day in Toronto. And we just can't we can't shut those down. So what choices politicians make when the disease is there and it's running right? The infections are running, you know, at a at a relatively low level, but they're still there, and they're at a low they're at a high enough level that they can explode if 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 all the kind of shackles are taken off. That's a really difficult position to be in because you can't simply say, well, 200 infections a day is okay. We can handle it from the from an ICU perspective. Therefore, we're good to go, right? And we're just going to open things up. So what they need to do is kind of keep encouraging people to to persist in in being in practicing social distancing and in being safe about the groups, people that they're together, and doing those simple things around hand washing. They probably need to push on masks um, a bit more, um, but they need to figure out how they can do all those things and then get to the fall when we're going to reopen schools, which is really the I think that really must be the toughest the toughest part of this because reopening mm-hmm. schools as people going back to work and then it's a whole different ball game. Could you sort of get us into the head of policymakers as well, in as much as they're trying to make decisions based on the most up-to-date information that they have, but sometimes there is a lag between reporting time, between the most up-to-date information, and and the time at which they have to make a call. How difficult is that for them? Oh, I think think this is, I think this is remarkably difficult. Look, human, human cognition is such that we're just bad at making connections between uh, a cause and some effect when there's any delay between the between the cause um, and the effect, and this is this is a disease which has these social dynamics. It's a virus which has social dynamics in how it spreads, and we don't know how to control those behavioral things that that, that kind of um, um, that uh, that cause the disease to spread more or less, and and we have a hard time kind of seeing cause and effect between a closing or an opening policy because, A, we actually don't know as much as we need to know about how the disease transmits, right? But also that there's all those things that happen between when a policy is put in place and then when when you can actually see the numbers that may be the result of that policy. You know, I mean, I'll just, I mean, a, a kind of anecdotal example is that, you know, there was, a, there was a concern that after all those, all those young people got together in Trinity Bellwoods Park and understand why they did, and there were 10,000 people in what's a pretty small park, that there would be a spike in cases. Not a huge amount of evidence that, that 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 happened as a result of that. Not a huge amount of evidence that that um, Corona is spreading because of the because of the uh, you know the mass gatherings in the in the United States. We should be as even handed as possible in getting those in getting those data. But the point is that we don't know enough about how the disease actually transmits to be able to make precise recommendations about uh, how the virus transmits. To make precise recommendations about what mix of policies are perfect. So. You know, what you have then are politicians who are engaging in a lot of risk averse behavior, right, where they're saying, let's keep things locked down a little bit longer. And, you know, we'll write the checks we have to to, to make up for people's lost income. Let's keep things locked down a little bit tighter because we just don't know what's going to work. But we know that this big mix of locking everything down seems to work. Well, we do know there is some fatigue with all of these protocols that are now in place. And we've got a chart here that we'll share with you and our viewers. And I'll describe it a little bit, a little bit rather, for those listening on podcast. If you start at the left of this chart, you see there is pretty good adherence to the notion of social or physical distancing. About three quarters of the people, and it really doesn't matter what part of the country you're in, it's still pretty high adherence to these protocols. But as the months go on, and just follow those squiggly lines to the right of the chart, and you can see, and again, I will, uh, I'll, for those who can't see, I'll describe it, there is less adherence as you go along to the point where by the middle of June, uh, you've got, you know, you've got a good 5, 10, 15% of people starting to decline to follow the measures of, of uh, social distancing. How do the politicians um, continue to get people to try to buy into a policy that they look like they are fatiguing from? Yeah, this is a very difficult one. So let me just say two things about it quickly. That there's the way we measure social distancing in this case is we ask people um, whether they've um, 
what percentage of the following six things they've done. These are easy things, eh? Avoid crowded places, avoid in-person contact with friends, families, and acquaintances, maintain two meters distance, avoid domestic travel, avoid public transit, and avoid the grocery store at peak times. Not overly difficult things to do, though actually hard to maintain for a long time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and to do on a week-over-week -week basis. And the story is that people were doing about three-quarters of those things at the start of this, and now they're doing about two-thirds of those things, or 60% of those things. The declines are most pronounced among people who are younger. They're more pronounced among men, but they're most, most pronounced among people who are younger who feel a little bit more invincible. Our data, is, our, our data is the following, that when people are exposed to the economic costs of social distancing and, and of a lockdown, when they're told about what the future costs this are likely to be, or, for example, when a big report comes out, like the April jobs report, that showed just how severe the cost of this lockdown has been on the economy, they expect that other people are going to defect from social distancing in the future, so they in, themselves think that they're going to defect from it. So we've got a big coordination effort here, right, where everybody's kind of in this together. Everybody's socially distancing because they understand it's good for them, but it's good for other people. But people are looking down the pipe and saying, boy, this, is, this thing is going to be very costly to keep doing, so I don't know that I'm going to do it forever. And they know that other people are saying that. So what I worry about is that we're really on you know, not a knife's edge, but, but, but we're at a point where people start compromising on more of these things. They start going to stores more. They start seeing more friends because they, and their family and their grandparents because they miss them. You know, they start, they start going to public places more to keep, to keep uh, community transmission, transmission down. And finally, you know, the people who are just, who are least willing to keep a body by this, and politicians I think know this, are young people, those 18 to 34, and those who live outside of cities because they're saying, boy, you know, why do I... Why am I engaging in all this social distancing when, when the virus is in Toronto, but it's not in Timmins, or it's not in Sudbury, or it's not in North Bay, or it's not in some other place that, that's been able to wrestle it down to the ground? So I think that you know, the, the long story short here, Steve, is that the challenge for policymakers is that it becomes more and more personally costly for people to keep up this social distancing. So they've got to convince them that it is the right thing to do. And if they're not going to do it, there's got to be some alternative like masking. Right. Peter Lowen, professor. Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T. Always good of you to join us here on TVO. Thanks so much and be safe. Thanks very much, Steve. You too. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. Tomorrow, we'll bring you the other half of the debate among the candidates for the leadership of the federal Green Party. Also, as Ontario's capital city finally enters phase two of the COVID-19 reopening, we'll get an update on the emerging science related to the pandemic. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.